What is up, brothers and sisters? It's Jay Campbell, and you're listening to the Jay Campbell Podcast. Join me for regular deep dives with amazing beings whose work is manifesting a golden age. And remember, you create your reality by your focused thoughts, conscious words, and intentional actions. Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. Hey guys, what's up? It's Jay Campbell and I'm making a quick commercial here for seercustom.com, my revolutionary cosmeceutical peptides company, co-founded with my business partner, Nick Andrews, who happens to be one of the world's top formulators. We have the revolutionary Oxano Grow, which completely regrew my hair. If you guys saw my hair about a year ago, I was almost bald. I even had the micropigmentation program from uh, Advantis. And now I've completely regrown my hair. That's just with version one. Version two is now in the marketplace or will be very, very soon. And it is three to five times as more effective than the current version or the original beta version of Oxano. We also have Royal Blue Serum and Sky Blue Cream, which will completely upgrade your face. I mean, I'm almost 50 years old. I have a pretty good complexion. I use it regularly. My wife swears by it. It will reduce fine lines and wrinkles, dramatically improve elasticity, and just the overall look and feel of your face. You feel great on both of them. You can also use them with red light therapy. There's all sorts of great stuff. So go to a seercustom.com. And if you're a first time customer, use the coupon J15 to take 15% off your purchase. I appreciate all you guys. And I send you tremendous love and light. Hey guys, what is going on? It's Jay Campbell, of course, the founder of the now Jay Campbell podcast. And I'm incredibly humbled, privileged, and honored to be joined today in my virtual Zoom studio halfway around the world in Chiang Mai, Thailand, with an incredible person, Victor Black. Victor, what is going on, bro? It's uh, it's good times, Jay. I've, uh, as you well aware, we're just talking before the show, I've been uh, dutifully trying to grow my profile around the world, and, and slowly, slowly, we're, we're starting to get traction one mind at a time. So it's a it's an it's exciting time. I'm I'm, I'm very pleased with what's happening, and, and very pleased to be on the show. I appreciate the opportunity, buddy. That's awesome. Well, you're about to blow the what in the fuck up, bro. <laughs> so let me just tell you guys about Victor's uh, bio. And, you know, personally, uh, I've been following Victor a long time, you know, in the shadows. Uh, Victor is definitely, in my opinion, um, one of the smartest guys on the planet in actually teaching men, and I'm sure plenty of women too, how to actually use performance, performance enhancing agents to live a long time. Now that is a very powerful disclaimer because most people who show people how to use performance enhancing agents don't give a shit about a person's health. And Victor has always stood out in the crowd as that guy. And, you know, I told him off the air and, you know, him and I have spoken on Facebook, you know, years back, but uh, you know, this is an honor to have him here today because he's very intelligent. He's, you know, I would literally say you're enlightened when it comes to talking about this. And, you know, one of the subjects that we're going to be talking about today is obviously DHT and how it's a rabbit hole uh, in, in its inhibition towards preventing hair loss and regrowing hair. And, you know, that's a, among other things. But I mean, Victor, man, again, dude, it's an honor to have you here today. Why don't you tell me and tell the audience for people that don't know you, like, you know, how you got into this game? Yeah, thank you. Um, so my my background is a little bit different to a, a lot of what I would consider to be harm reduction educators. There, there are a number. We just spoke before about uh, you know, gents like you know Dr. Scott Howe. I'm a, a huge fan of his work. There, there are a number of you know uh, people in the marketplace that are presenting quality education. I guess most of them are. And Scott's an androgen researcher. This is, you know, he did his PhD in, in androgen toxicology. Yep. My, my, my background is a little different. I'm, I'm a uh, weapons engineer from the military, but That's I actually awesome. think that that helps to some degree because at the end of the day, the, the, the job of the engineer is to solve problems. And I believe, you know, in, uh, berating individuals for the, for the use of these, you know, products is, is, doesn't serve any potential benefit, like telling people off, right? They're going to use these drugs. Um, my my role, as I see it, is is trying to show people that there are, in my opinion, ways to use these tools and to realize outcomes that fulfill our needs, emotional needs and physi physiological needs, 
but but with a view to longevity and a view to you know what I what I like to refer to as, as safer use. I, I don't think safe is a responsible term. I sure. think we have to accept some measure of risk whenever we go into self administration and pharma, pharmacology. Absolutely. Um, but 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 say for use, and as I said, I I am you know walking the talk and talking the talk. I'm in my mid fifties now. I've been training for thirty five years. I've been doing yep. this for a very long time. Um, I help with powerlifters and strength athletes, with bodybuilders, with you know endurance athletes, and, and really people across the board. And although I do coaching, I, I guess my my great passion is really trying to spread the safe for use message to the wider community. But there is a way to do this a rational, logical, methodical way based on balancing clinical evidence and, you know, hands-on decades of practical experience in which a way we can uh, mitigate most of the risk, if not all of the risk here. Yeah, well, well said, man. And, and and again, that's why I love you, man. You know, you, you're able to bridge, truly being a gym bro. Yeah. Bridge, bridge the gap. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, you know, you have an elite physique. You've competed at the most elite levels. Like you said, you're a master's class bodybuilder, still in your 50s. You know, you're, you've able to use, you know, various chemicals and not fuck yourself up. I mean, again, there are so many people that have gone down the path that, you know, you have gone and, you know, somewhat myself course of being an experimental guinea pig and doing the things mm -hmm. that I did in my thirties and my early forties, uh, you know, and we're walking that same path. You know, we obviously are all about clinical efficacy and then long-term health and safety. And again, like I said, you know, I'll, I'll be leading or uh, pointing to all of Victor's uh, websites and of course, online uh, brand locations and stuff at the end of this pay it's thing. But, you know, you can look at his pictures and you can see that this guy is, you know, not only, uh, you know, what I would call a paragon of physical health, but he's also got it together internally, which is what's most important in today's day and age. So, um, and I, and by the way, I didn't say that, but um, his bio just, for the record, is enhancement practices harm reduction educator with a with a focus on balancing clinical evidence, as he already said, 35 years of practical hands-on experience. Again, helping people live a longer, stronger life. And, and again, you said it, and I'll add to it. I don't give a shit what your degree is, and you know, whether you're an advanced endocrinologist or urologist or you know, a functional medicine expert, you know, mm. having an experiential body of work. Correct. Is what's most important, you know, and, you know, the, the, our, the old school, you know, Dr. Krizzler, you know, is probably the most famous TRT doc ever. You know, he always said that the only goal for a man and, you know, using therapeutic testosterone, and this really stretches to anybody, anything you're using therapeutically is happiness mm -hmm. and health. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that qualification or those two criteria, as you know, are very rarely understood by the average practicing physician mm -hmm. who prescribes therapeutic testosterone, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what would you say to that? I mean, like, how is your experience in dealing with the, the, the many clinicians that you've dealt with over the years who absolutely don't have a fucking clue? When well, it comes I, I think they fall into two camps. I mean, it's very polarizing. There are There is a, a, a methodology of practicing medicine that is referred to as evidence-based practice. Sure. And, and, and the, the, for anyone that doesn't know the term, I'm sure most people do, the, the premise of evidence-based practice is that we value the clinical evidence, of course. What does the, what does the evidence have to say on this subject? Yeah. And I, I, I will just expand on that just for a moment. I think it's fair to say that we live in this domain or this era right now of what we call the evidence-based trainer, the evidence-based educator. There's lots and lots of people out there putting out content, and it's become the way it's done to attach a study to a statement, you know, really as a, you know, proof point to kind of like bolster up. The, 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 now the great challenge of course, becomes any one study at any point in time on any subject can be refuted. Absolutely. What we really need to focus on is, so, so what does the entire body of evidence suggest about subject X? And no, no better example would be something that, you know, and I, I know, believe me, I know I'm singing to the choir here, but, you could, in theory, go to PubMed or another reference you know, database and, and, and just randomly find a study on testosterone replacement therapy that will suggest that testosterone replacement therapy is connected to cardiovascular disease or prostate health. We, we just know this is not true. But the point is you can find a study on, right, that says this, this study would suggest this. The reality is, is that that's not factual, that you actually, if you're going to make a statement about testosterone replacement therapy and prostate health, you actually have to make a comment on, so what does the entire body of evidence lead us to, to you know, the, the, at the ultimate outcome? And this is potentially a challenge because, you know, it's very easy for an individual to grasp on one study and be biased by it rather than have the capacity to step back and says, look, if there are 
a hundred studies on subject X and 99 of them say this and one of them says that, then there's, there's, you know, it's not unreasonable to expect an outlier on anything. Yeah. So most doctors, that's their strength. That's, that's what they learn at medical school. Obviously the evidence-based practice community tend to balance that against, you know, clinical observation for the things they've seen in practice that aren't necessarily supported in the clinical evidence and blending those two things together with one other level, which is client preference. At the end of the day, you know, the client's preferences here should be taken into account whenever you're looking at any sort of, you know, therapeutic or treatment-based recommendation for anything, you know? So who are they and what do they want? And are there, are there preferences that need to be taken? I don't know that, I, I don't think it's fair to say that any, but most doctors don't operate on that premise of those three things hold equal weight. Most don't, some do, but most don't. So, um, and, and this is really, you know, some of the things we're going to talk today about is like, you know, the, the, the role of DHT, and DHT is, a, in my opinion, a, a metabolite of the testosterone hormone that has been unnecessarily vilified you know, in, over the years. Um, anyone that's watching this, anyone that's familiar with the content would be familiar with the premise of things like, well, testosterone is bad for your prostate. You know, testosterone is this, testosterone that is that. And, you know, we've, we've kind of moved on. We, we now, you know, we, we now have a better understanding of, you know, what is the relationship between androgens testosterone, DHT, other androgens, and the human prostate, we've kind of put that argument to bed that says, look, it's true to say that the human prostate is exquisitely sensitive to androgens, but there's a saturation point beyond which the addition of more androgens has no serious magnitude of effect here. Now, the, the great challenge is, you know, I'm now entering into the debate about, you know, human hair health, and, and I'm facing many of the same biases and premises and where people... 10 years ago would have gotten their, their knickers in a twist saying, look, testosterone and DHT don't cause prostate issues. You know, benign prostate hyperplasia is a disease state of aging and of exactly. insulin sensitivity. And you most likely see it in someone who's hypergonadal, not in someone that has elevated testosterone levels. 10 years ago, I would have had trouble convincing people of that fact. Exactly. I mean, you, you, you walk that walk yourself, right? Better than probably anyone, right? And, you know, we're now entering what I think is the next stage saying, okay, so we, we need to now start talking about hair health and what really underlies hair loss pathology. And, and I'm just be honest with you, most doctors and most people just don't have a firm understanding of where we are at in terms of clinical evidence today. So, you know, I wanted to take an opportunity on the, on the show to you know, start that dialogue. I know it's going to be challenging for some people, including doctors. I get it. But I think that we're at the point where the evidence is overwhelming. This is not a discussion of you know, maybe this is a discussion of, I just don't think you understand the current state of clinical evidence. Bro, you're yeah. amazing. Uh, let me just add, yes. And, and, and by the way, the Jay Campbell podcast with Victor Black is where we start <laughs> this conversation today. And I will put it to bed and start it right now unequivocally. And as I told you off the air, my business partner, Nick Andrews, you know, very high level biochemist, one of the greatest formulators, you know, obviously our company. And so, yes, I do have a vested interest in this conversation, but as you said, this is state of the science and this has to be put forward into the ether now. Correct. But the reality is, is that the entire DHT inhibition rabbit hole that mainstream medicine has chased, as you know, Victor, for fucking mm -hmm. 35 years. Plus, yeah, plus. Is a farce. And you and I are going to set that record, obviously, in this conversation here today. But uh, I'm I'm hoping it's going to be made a little bit easier by the fact that people have put it to bed for the prostate. Exactly. If, if someone hasn't yet put that argument to bed for the prostate, I'm honest with you. I don't know that I can reach them. That's true. That's true. But if someone has said, yeah, that's fucking bullshit. Testosterone is not bad for the male prostate. It's probably the best thing you could do as an aging male. Right? It, it, if someone says, look, yeah, I've heard that bullshit, right? And it's not true. And even my own doctor doesn't understand, right? right? right. That individual should be, in theory, open to the next dialogue, which is, and now let's talk about hair. Now, exactly. as I said, I'm repeating myself. I apologize, but I do accept that there are some people that still believe that androgens, elevation of androgens and elevation of DHT is going to have a deleterious effect on the human prostate. If that's you, you're not going to want to hear what I have to say. <laughs> but let's, let's, let's assume that because people are listening to your podcast, 
they already have gone, you know what, my, my, my doctor's doctor before, right, had no fucking idea what he was talking <laughs> about. And I now understand that, you know, the application of testosterone, you know, at, at physiological range and even outside of physiological range has no detrimental effect on the prostate at all. This, this is just complete bullshit. I'm hoping that person is going, okay, let's, let's fire away. Let's see what you have to say about here. Yeah. So if I can start with saying this, it is true that DHT and in fact, all androgens have the potential to have a, you know, a deleterious effect on hair growth. It's absolutely true, but you have to understand where it fits into the cascade. And what I mean by that is these androgens have the potential to be the hair growth promoters exactly. or hair loss accelerants based on a set of preconditions under which a human hair follicle is placed before it comes into contact with that, that hormone molecule. Okay. So if you understand that one of the problems with the administration of androgens to women, there are many side effects, change of the vocal cords, you know, the, the, vo the, vo the voice, you know, architecture, but, you know, we, we see, you know, accelerated hair growth, like from the, for the, so we elevate androgens, we see hair growth. Androgens don't, you know, cause hair loss. They have the potential to act as hair growth promoters. They have the potential to act as hair loss accelerants, right. but under a set of preconditions. The best example I can offer anyone is understanding this. Many of the tools that we use in the enhancement community, testosterone, um, you know, IGF-1, growth hormone, the list is quite long. You could plausibly make an argument to say, look, these drugs have the potential to be tumor accelerants. If you have a pre-existing condition right. and you would raise your IGF-1 levels, it is plausible to say that you could potentially accelerate that, the growth of that tumor mass. But that right. doesn't mean that it caused the cancer. <laughs> it means that it, it has the potential to accelerate. And so if you, if you view it through that filter, you can say, right. So it's a valid discussion point that we must have about androgens. But the cascade does not begin with the introduction of androgens. The cascade begins far earlier than that. And, and there's a couple of, and as I said, this is the point about you know, science. Um, I, I just want to throw a couple of studies on the table because they, they're landmark studies. Yeah. So, you know, there was a study a while ago where they basically introduced very elevated androgen levels to, to men. Um, you know, the, I, I'll quote in nanograms per deciliter ranges, but um, if we were to say, look, you know, typical testosterone ranges for a natural healthy man might be in the 700 to 800 nanograms per deciliter range, okay? If you're an internationalist, you might have to understand what those units are. Then, you know, DHT typically is somewhere between seven to 10% of that, somewhere around 70 to 100 nanograms per deciliter. Now, they did a study in men where they basically reversed those ratios, where they drove, drove to DHT through the administration of DHT up to the 700 to 800 nanograms per deciliter range, and they held it there for two years. Now, the purpose behind that study was to demonstrate that DHTs are not responsible for negative deleterious impacts on prostate, okay? But the consequences would be most people would go, holy fuck, you drove DHT to seven to 800 nanograms per deciliter and you left it there for, 10, for two years. No negative impact on prostate, no acne and no hair loss issues basically reported in that study. So what does that lead us to believe? If you were to do that with individuals that had a precondition, you would expect to see an outcome, right? But all of the research that's happening in 2021, not 1955, right, is understanding that we've been trying to block you know the, the 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 metabolism of testosterone to dht on a systemic level for a long time now 30 plus years yep. and the success rate that we've seen in terms of you know prostate cancer benign prostate hyperplasia and male pattern boarding is is poor right there's a long list of potential deleterious side effects associated with it and the clinical outcomes are poor and yeah. the research community recognizes this and the research community today is still investing billions, billions of dollars into looking at treatments for hair loss, but almost none of them, and I, I'm not, I'm, I say almost because I'm simply not aware of one, one may exist, right, uh, are not looking at the systemic suppression of DHT creation. Right. There are a number of studies that are looking at DHT on a localized level. So using peptides at the hair follicle level, agreed. Exactly. And that makes sense. I have no problem with that. But nobody is attempting to crush DHT systemically. And the reason behind that is because they are very, very well aware of the very long list of potential deleterious side effects that are associated right. with this. Everything from kidney health to basically cognitive function to changes of the morphology of the penis. This is a you know, pretty relatively serious business. And unfortunately, we have you know, people who are still in denial that still believe that DHT is responsible for prostate growth 
and DHT is still underlies hair loss. Now, as I said, if you understand what I'm saying is, I'm not saying it doesn't play a role, but there's a cascade of events that begins beyond that, before that. And if you really want to talk about a, a clinical treatment model for hair loss, you have to understand a few key points. One, um, human hair loss by definition is multifactorial. It's not one thing. It's not a bullet point. Very much like Alzheimer's disease. What causes Alzheimer's disease is a cascade of behaviors and a cascade of environmental conditions. Right. Yeah. And the reason they haven't been able to come up with a treatment model for Alzheimer's is because everybody's expecting a drug. And it's not, it's going to be basically a lifestyle intervention where it's a multifactorial problem with many factors basically that are, 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 are cause the treatment model. Now, in hair loss, the same thing is true. What, what underlies human hair loss is multifactorial, stimulatory or inhibitory inputs, okay? And if you simply recognize that, the logical treatment model is nothing more than this. Well, let's write down a list of all the things that we can think of that may be stimulatory and inhibitory towards hair growth, all right? Let's write down that list. And then let's ask ourselves one very simple question. Is there anything that we can do about those line items, line item by line item? And let's do that, whatever that is. It's not, it's a magic bullet that you take and cures Alzheimer's disease. It's not a magic pill that you take that cures hair loss. It's looking at this list and the list is quite long. Yes. And as a sideline, I'll just say for people that use enhancement like myself, the list gets even longer. Why? Right. Because um, things like the elevation of IGF-1 levels have the potential to add to the problem things like the elevation of prolactin levels, things like the modulation of hormone levels. We know through disease states like prolactemia and like uh, so elevation of, you know, IGF-1 levels, basically, you know, through, through natural disease states that, that, that there's, you know, balding issues and hair loss issues there. So we have a discussion about the natural individual or the someone that's within physiological range. And then we have a secondary discussion that's about, you know, okay, so is that a better or worse for the enhanced trainer? It's potentially a longer list of things that we must consider. Bro, that was poetry. I mean, I don't know any clinician can speak at that level. Um, so let me just talk about, because I wanted to say this before you completely destroyed my train of thought, which is good because my, I don't have much thought at this hour of the night, <laughs> as you know, to today. It's a long uh, day, yeah. Bro, that was phenomenal. I mean, literally, I can already see us pulling about three or four different pieces out of that to push across social media. But uh you know, back to your point, you know, you said that peptides, mm -hmm. using peptides. So, so let me go to where I'm going with my debate, not debate, but and again, I already know you would support this, but, you know, ultimately the disease states that all of us, not all of us, but most of us at some point in life will experience due to age is through inflammation, right? Sure. Inflammatory processes lead to cellular degradation. Cellular degradation over time leads to one of the various diseases of aging. I'll pull up Alzheimer's. You talked about that. That, as we know, in the smart people world is type three diabetes, mm -hmm. which as you said, is modulated by God knows how many factors. I mean, you know, life, genetics, it's genetic, eat, sex, behaviors, diet, environment. Yeah, and, 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 I mean, God yeah. knows it's, it's so long, like you said. So, you know, again, ultimately, if you're going to, live a lifestyle that's going to live you lead you to be longer which you and i both espouse you have to reduce inflammation and you know how do you reduce inflammation i mean that's not a conversation for me and you today because that's simple shit but for sure. average people who don't understand any of that like they're like uh i want to buy this pill i want to use this peptide i want to use deca you know but they don't live a lifestyle that's conducive to allowing any of those agents to, you know, effectively work, right. You know, quote right. unquote, because they don't understand that like everything as you already very elusive, elegantly elucidated is lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And so to live the lifestyle, it doesn't matter the agent. If you're not living the lifestyle, none of the agents are going to ultimately do that much. So back to my original point, which is if you're not living an inflammation suppressed life, Okay. And if we're talking about in the scalp, there are peptides, as you know, GHKCU, copper peptide, there's others, you know, there's many now actually coming into the scene that my guy is familiar with, but it doesn't matter, Victor, if you're not living a inflammation free lifestyle and focused on it, nothing that you use is going to help 
regain your hair. But you know, back to your point on DHT. And can, can I just can I just comment about that because I, I I do agree with the point that you're making, but I would I would like to be historically correct here because I think that this content has the potential to to, to reach a lot Please of people. Do. Yeah. Absolutely. So. I think it's important for people to understand that inflammation is something that we need to find the balance behind. And what I mean by that is in, inflammatory response is actually part of the hypertrophic process as well. Sure. So, so, so I try to caution the idea of like taking anything and snubbing it out. Like during, like I would say like, okay, so if you're, if you go into the gym and you're seeking a hypertrophic outcome, that really what you're doing is you're, you know, undertaking a series of deliberate and planned strategic actions that are designed to ultimately result in inflammation during in a positive way sort of thing. But then you have to balance that against the fact that like there's such a thing as too little and too much and there's timing and, the, and, the, and that sort of thing. So I completely, completely agree with you. I just want to be clear because I think a lot of people see this. Um, I don't want the message to be you know, inflammation's the enemy. I think right. it's understanding, you know, there's good inflammation, there's bad inflammation, there's a certain amount of, you know, oxidative stress that is beneficial to the human physiology. There is absolutely a point, a threshold that you reach where you reach, you know, you reach a critical mass where you start to see toxicology, to toxic effects, sort of thing. So, yeah, if, if we if we just talk quickly about, uh, you know, the, these underlying factors that influence human hair loss. Well, let me just so, say first off, thanks for correcting me because everything is about balance. You know, yeah, well, it's all every everything is about balance. It's like you know, Andrews, as I was talking about, there is such a thing as too little, you mean? And you know, sorry, I, I'm gonna I'm, I just want to say this and then we'll come back because it's an important point. One of the greatest challenges I'm getting trying to get people to understand is I never tell people that won't work. Exactly. I'm just trying to get people to understand that look, if we sit down and we have this discussion in a logical, rational fashion, you may well find there's a way to get this outcome with less deleterious effect on our health. Do you mean? And one of the things that I'm I'm trying to explain to people is you know, this this practice of what they call like, you know, cycling steroids in, in, in androgen use. Yeah. So there's the application of steroids and then people come off and they go back on and they come off. What they didn't realize is elevated androgens are very bad for your health. Like men, like your, your brain, like sure. is, is not, you know, elevated androgens are, are not your friend in that regard. Prime for a number of reasons, including elevated inflammation, right. elevated oxidative stress, elevated this, but that's also true for the hypogonadal man. Do you so, you know, there's as much damage to be done to cognitive function by having not enough testosterone. So this, pre this, this practice of, you know, nothing and too much and nothing and too much, you're basically getting hit with the, the stick at both ends of the game sort of thing. And I try to encourage people, look, if you're going to expose yourself to the applications of androgens, you should go on and stay on. Absolutely. Don't, don't keep coming off and attempting to restart the HPTA because effectively what you do when you go through that process is you expose yourself to the same, you know, environmental conditions as a hypogonadal man does for, for many weeks. So you have this blast, that's not good. You have this hypogonadal state, that's not good. And you never have a period of what we call normalized or physiological levels of anything. It's always well, too much or too little. It's unbelievable. Post-cycle therapy is a myth. I mean, it's nothing. Stupid idea. <laughs> it's a stupid idea. I mean, it's the I, dumbest thing ever. I'm I, so glad that you put that I'm out. empathetic because it's the way it's been done for a long yeah. time. But it's the same thing as I'm empathetic to people that have trouble understanding that DHT doesn't cause hair loss. Androgens doesn't cause... Why? Because they've been told this for 35 years. They've exactly. been told that androgens damage... You know, androgens are responsible for problems with your prostate. They've been told it so many times that it's very hard to break through. Your audience, as I've already said a couple of times, is very well positioned to understand this argument because you go, look, everything they told us about the prostate is bullshit. Everything, exactly. right? Really? So everything they told us about DHT and hair loss, I would say there's some context to it. Under certain set of conditions, once, you, once the pendulum has swung too far, it's very, very hard to do anything but to try to block androgens at the hair follicle. But I would argue... The way to do that would be to try and block it either topically or or in a, in a targeted you know, strategic sense in a surgical fashion the hair follicle don't take dht and crush it systemically because ultimately as i said we have very good evidence to say look systemic levels of dht are not correlated with androgenic alopecia that they are not the same thing it's what's happening at the at the, at the level of the of the scalp hey guys what's going on it's jay campbell quick commercial 
for the Optimized Tribe with U.S. Navy SEAL Michael Jaco and I every Monday night at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. There is not a single group online where you will get the highest level intel that Michael and I can provide you from mastering intuition to fully optimizing your hormonal health to improving your fitness, to raising your vibration and increasing your consciousness. There isn't a single group online with two dudes like Michael and myself helping people become the best version of their self. It's literally $99 a month and you get a 90 minute call with me and Michael every single Monday night. Don't wait another second. Sign up now at the link, theoptimizedtribe.com. I appreciate you guys and I send you tremendous love and light. Again, proper peptide peptide GHKCU yep. in the scalp. Again, yep. all other conditions being met, low inflammation, you know, you are doing all the other things that you must do to, to mitigate the, you know, multifactorial reasons of hair loss. Sure. When you grows your hair, I mean, bro, this is carbon 60 and yep. GHKCU combined. And, you know, yep. if you look at my videos a year ago, my fucking yep. head was bald. Yep. I even had the micropigmentation head tattoo done on my scalp, the Vantus yep. thing. And, this is now uh, not 10, essentially 10 months, give mm -hmm. or take eight of consistent usage of our product. Again, I'll be a shill, but anybody can put GHKCU and carbon 60 in your scalp and regrow their hair. Mm -hmm. This is what, you know, I have done. Now the guys that don't get the same results, obviously there is, you know, androgenic alopecia, there's genetic shedding and predisposition, but mm -hmm. by and large, Victor, you know, to your point, if you live an inflammatory free lifestyle, stressing balance, yes, there's inflammasomes needed for growth and mm -hmm. hypertrophy, but ultimately you can regrow your hair, but the average guy drinking fucking six packs, six beers a night, eating Cheetos and, and, and drinking, I mean, uh, pizza is not going to have the results as the guy who lives the lifestyle that you and I, 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 I don't think he's listening to you either, Jada. <laughs> <laughs> probably he's not, he's not listening to you yeah. but, but 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 ultimately it's important that people who watch this podcast and you know get this profound what knowledge and awareness that you are providing realize that everything is determinate relative to the things that you do in support of whatever agent you're using and again so okay. many guys like you said are not going to hear this and are going to buy the shiny peptide or the shiny pill or take the drug or whatever but you'll never get the results that the people who live everything else again in balance get. Mm. And again, you and I are perfect examples of this. You're 50. How old are you now again? 54. Yeah. So I'm 50. You're 54. Mm. And we look better than most people have our age because of the things that we do again, systemically. It's not. I'm, I'm very bad. off off season at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I know, I understand. I agree. I completely agree. With you. If, maybe, if, maybe, if, maybe I can even inflammatory factors, though. Right now, Victor. I agree. No, I agree. Let, let, let me. Maybe I can paint a framework for people because it's all very well and good for me to stand on a soapbox and pontificate about multifactorial inputs and stimulatory. I, I would say the average person, at the end of the day, needs to go through a couple of processes. One is a, a, a moment of awareness, going, "Oh, holy fuck, that actually makes a lot of sense." You have to go through that moment. You go, you know what? We've been blaming this. In reality, it's multiple stimulatory input. We need to we need to fo we need to shift our attention away from demonizing a hormone molecule, right? To looking at okay, so what potentially is on this list, and what could we do? I would argue that there are a number of very complementary and very logical, you know, potential treatment models that someone who is serious about this could layer on top of each other, and even within this framework, there's enough latitude and scope for individuals basically saying okay so what mechanism of action would i do that I'll, I'll give a simple example there's very good evidence to suggest that um one of the biggest problems with the human scalp is what they refer to as chronic scalp tension yeah and the the lack of you know in what we would call you know in uh, it's called hypoxia it's a lack of oxygen in the scalp okay right. So there are, you know, if you identify that, okay, so hypoxia, the lack of oxygen, what, why does that affect us? Because you need oxygen for testosterone to metabolize to estrogen. Right. Without the oxygen, you cannot see that cascade. And so if testosterone doesn't metabolize to estrogen, it's more likely to metabolize to DHT. This is a, this is a um, thing, right? So the, the, the lack of the fertility of the field, if you want to take it in really agricultural terms, right? Okay, now, what might we do about that? One could argue, okay, so there's a there's a discussion to be had about dermal rollers and 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 you know that that concept. 
happy to, to look at the clinical evidence that we have to support that. There's a one that said, look, scalp massage is the way to go. You know, you need to get someone to massage your scalp. There's, you know, people that could look at, you know, treatments like minoxidil and, and, and other vasodilators that potentially add to that. Now, I don't know that that, that, that each one of those, you could say, okay, so each of these discussions is really about this discussion about, you know, getting oxygen into the scalp. Okay. And then you could have a discussion about microinflammation, which I completely support with yourself. And then really under that banner, you have a discussion about, so let's look at what our options are. Let's look at the practicality of the application. Let's look at the cost. Let's look at the, you know, the efficacy of these treatments. Right. But I think it's fair to say that in each of these domains, there's going to be potential alternatives that one could consider and one could try, you know, and, and I encourage people to experiment, but the first step in the process is that light bulb going off and going, aha, it's not fucking DHT. It's a multiple things. And I have to basically, my treatment model is going to be right. If I need to focus on getting more oxygen into the scalp, then I might consider a derma roller. I might consider minoxidil. I might get a massage. And, and quite honestly, there's no reason that an individual can't do all three of those. Right. And then you would go, okay, so what about microinflammation? And this is to your point. Like, I think it's very valid. That makes sense. But in my opinion, that treatment model that you're talking about is very complementary to the first. It's not either or, you would potentially do them both. Right. And then there's another layer that you would say, okay, so what about antioxidants, the elevation of oxidative stress? Is there any you know, supporting evidence to say the application of you know, antioxidants is, guys, yes, there's very good. There's been some very good studies that looking at the topical application of melatonin, for example, has potential benefit. But in my opinion, the answer is much, much simpler for people. And that is when we look at the studies where they combined two treatment models together, regardless of what those treatment models were, one plus one is three. This is supported in all of the clinical trials. Right. So right. right now, the reason I think that we're failing in this domain, most men, is because the clinical evidence is you know, pretty much looking at monotherapies, this versus this. And then the few studies that actually do look at them together, every single one that I've seen, at least, I'm not suggesting it's not plausible, there's something out there that showed no effect, seems to suggest that one plus one equals three. Right. So the answer here is relatively simple. As I said, you write down a list of all the potential stimulatory and inhibitory inputs, and you ask yourself the question, okay, so what, if anything, can I do about those inputs, right? And then you write down a list of potential treatment models that are both practical and seem to have some measure of you know, efficacy. As you said, your personal um, testimony towards the, the pathway that you're taking, may, may, maybe people would do that. I'm simply trying to encourage people to say, okay, so take that product from Jay and let's put that on the table, but please don't fall into the same trap that the, that the DHT you know, blocking people are doing, which is it's not that. Right. Do them all. If there's six or seven things, I, I would argue. So my own uh, model would potentially be, I have the great privilege and benefit of living in Thailand every week. You know, people have been to Thailand would know that we can get a, a lovely massage here very cheap. Yep. Every yep. week, my wife and I go and get a massage. And part of that process is I pay the man at the end of the massage period for 20 minutes to rub my scalp. Now, I'm not for one moment suggesting that and in and as of itself is the answer. I just think that it makes rational sense that that is a logical contributor to the, the model in its entirety. Now, Beautiful. some people are going to say, well, that's not practical for me, Victor, because, you know, massage is so expensive here. And you might say, well, my wife's not prepared to do it. And I understand that. But this is the <laughs> premise that you'd say, OK, so as long as you understand that the cause is multifactorial, the treatment model is potentially multifactorial. And as long as we're having this discussion, I'm supportive of anyone's ideas or theories. You just have to recognize that in the world, the billion dollar research community to hair loss, there are many, 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 many different treatment models. And each one of them is showing some measure of success, even the, you know, something obscure, they, uh, you know, they've done some studies where they've injected Botox into men's scalp to basically get the scalp to relax and they've shown effect here. Now, again, I just don't want people to make the mistake of saying, okay, so I'm going to do that. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you want to treat Alzheimer's, you have to adopt a model that says, look, all of these in stimulatory inputs are the cause. And my best shot, my best shot at avoiding, you know, a dementia state in later age is to look at each of those causal factors in turn 
and come up with a mitigation strategy for each one of them and not be doing what people are doing now, which is looking for a single bullet point that you hit that, hit, you hit that button and you go, right, that's, that's it. That's j job done for me as it were. So th this, this is, uh, this is, I think where we're at. So as I said, th the idea that, you know, anti-inflammatory tools, like the one that you've had experienced great, great success with, I, I fully support that fabulous, but I would just encourage people to say, you know what, what, what else, what, what else are we going to do here? Yeah. I mean, and you know, just to, 100% you're accurate, you know, to say that, you know, my business partner, again, Nick Andrews has a whole batch of other things that you should do. And I'll just throw Correct. them in, you know, like you said. And so again, it's a synergistic approach. It's Correct. it's ultimately balanced, but you know, what can I throw from a kitchen sink at it that is synergizing with the other Correct. things? So, I mean, I'll just tell you like PRP. Absolutely. Cup top, a red yep. light hat. Absolutely. Like you said, increasing mass you know, massage into the scalp, increasing oxygen, I mean, oxygen into the scalp. I mean, there are a lot of things. And so you're absolutely 100% right. But then it becomes down to the people watching the show be like, oh, Jay and Victor, you guys are elite biohackers and you guys have access and no people. And so, I mean, I think it, you know, for the common person watching mm. this, you know, to really wrap this up. And by the way, I'm going to bring you on. We'll do another podcast on using drugs. Yeah. Because we haven't got, we haven't my, my, really, my, my great, great love. Well, it's not the right. It, it, I mean, truthfully, today we're, we're providing serious clairvoyance here on this yeah. topic, which is there's been, there's you know, there's great insight here. There is actually great. Insight oh, here. absolutely. It, it seems simple, but it's actually very insightful. Oh, no, no, yeah, no, absolutely. Mm. But uh, I do want to bring you on and talk about your real specialty, which is like, mm. you know, how can aging men mm. literally look like Greek fucking gods and live till ninety five. Right. Mm. Like that's what, and maybe 130. You know, the interesting thing, let me, let me comment about that. Cause, cause that, cause that's the reason I'm talking about this is this, I find that I'm able to have a crossover discussion because many of the practices that I'm engaging in, I actually say, okay, yes, well, I'm probably got the volume turned up to 11. I agree. Right. But many of my practices are taken directly from the things that we might do to basically combat age-related muscle wasting and exactly. dementias and dementias. And people don't understand that is where most of my frameworks and models come from is from studying the, uh, the, the emerging evidence and the clinical literature and the efficacy and safety of these tools in combating age-related diseases of sure. the mind and of the body. During, now, the, what, the separation point for myself is I turn the volume up to 11. Doing. And and there will come a time in my life as I get you know in probably a little later I'll probably turn the volume down to eight. Doing, right. but many of those practices will remain in place. And this is the great irony that a lot of people don't understand. And that is, they people may look at me and say, "Look, you're taking great risk." And I would say, mm, "I'm not sure you understand quite what I'm doing because all <laughs> of these practices have the potential, based on the uh, the the magnitude of inputs here." to either be seen as anti-aging practices, the, 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 the modulation of hormonal pathways that deteriorate through aging. Sure. Right. The implication of, you know, age relating, you know, cognitive decline and things like that. So a lot of the compounds that I use and a lot of the strategies that I use are, are literally the sorts of things that I would be placing on someone to say, this is how we combat aging. But the difference is, and I completely agree. There's a difference is, so how much are we using? rather than what are we using yeah so it's it's a very interesting conversation you just need to be open-minded enough to say look you know the, at the end of the day with pharmacology it's a very simple thing to say but it is remarkably true and that is the dose is the poison 100 percent. i mean literally 100 percent um i mean again like i said i'm going to bring you on final thoughts though on dhd inhibition yeah. um, as it relates to the way the world and science kind of understands it right now yeah, I'm, I'm extremely empathetic because I think it's fair to say for, for decades, we have been literally hit over the head with this message from our, from our doctors, from the, from even from the research from the community, from the pharma, pharmacology industry, that basically, you know, you know, DHT is the enemy, you know, and that, you know, the systemic suppression of DHT is the pathway forward for, you know, prostate health and for hair health, yeah. And, and so that, that it's only natural with that level of, you know, I can only call it, you know, manipulation, you know, that one 
tends to believe that stuff. And it's only when you actually go looking at the current state of play to say, yeah, that's true. We believe that. I'm not, I'm not saying there's a conspiracy. I'm saying that is what we believe 25 years ago. We have moved forward. The clinical evidence that we have to support, you know, DHT systemically being bad for prostate health, this discussion is over, right? The idea that systemic DHT is what contributes to male hair loss is that discussion is over, right? Yes, localized suppression of DHT is something that is still being researched and there are millions of dollars, but, but no one's advocating systemic DHT suppression, except for one group of people, the people that currently sell DHT suppression. <laughs> you mean, bro, I think the only you're taking left. like an asteroid, bro. <laughs> <laughs> they're the only people left. And, and I have to be honest with you, people who have been selling that message for 20 years, you know, in, in other words, you go to your doctor and you basically, he says that. So this is really a situation where the research community, this, this ship has sailed. It's gone. The only people banging that drum anymore are the people with a vested interest in it right. not going away. And that is the people that either sell it or the people that basically write scripts. You know? exactly. And you only have to look under the cover a little bit and you go, holy crap, like what we thought was true when these drugs came into play, right? I'm not, I'm not saying it's a conspiracy. What we thought was true, we now know is not true. Exactly. And so we have to move on. We have to say, you know what, things move on. So this is the nature of science. When we are presented, a scientific mind does this. You're allowed to be wrong. Exactly. But what you have to do is you have to accept, look, when you're presented with overwhelming evidence, you have to be prepared to change your opinion. And this is the crossroads that we are at today. The evidence that we have to support this discussion is not fragmented. Right. The evidence that we have is not, I think, the evidence we have is like, it's over, the conversation's over, let's move on. So now the conversation is, so what antioxidant, what peptide, what, you know, you know that, that's the conversation. Now, just so I'm very clear, because I don't, I've had people say to me before, you think you have the cure to baldness. No, I don't. The conversation I'm having is, tell me more about that peptide, Jay. Exactly. That's the conversation I'm having. That's I want to exactly know right. about that peptide and how that peptide works and its potential efficacy. I'm not fucking interested in systemic blocking of DHT anymore. I don't have the answers to what we should be doing on a prescriptive basis. I'm just simply trying to get people to abandon the historical framework and move forward and start pressing you saying, hey, Jay, you need to tell me more about this peptide, buddy. How does this work again? This, this is all I'm trying to do at this point in time. Now, my hope, my desire is in another five years from now, it may take longer, it may take less time. We will be in the position where we can answer that question. I'm just very honest with you. I know you have a, a product to sell. I don't have that answer. I'm actively seeking that answer. Yeah. And I think that if there's one message for people from this is that it's just, just ask, Jay, what's this fucking peptide about? You know, right. it's, so, so we're abandoning the DHT discussion, and now we're looking at oxidative stress, inflammation, blood flow. So, Jay, do you sell a do you sell a vasodilator? No, that's not what we do. Right, I need to get that over here. And what do you got on offer? And what's this guy got on offer? And potentially, you know, if ten individuals stepped up and had this conversation in a logical, rational sense, if we saw those ten individuals walk away with a different model for each ten individuals, but each of those models potentially contained maybe three to six different, you know, action items. Uh, my job's done. I can move on to the next conversation here. Beautiful, man. And I, and listen, I, I'm in total agreement with you. And again, I, I would tell you that, you know, right now, this is just literally V1, you know, I mean, actually yeah. our product is V2, yeah. but you know, Nick will tell you that we'll have four peptides, yeah. uh, you know, obviously a blood stimulator, uh, sure. and, and antioxidant. I mean, so so you're exactly right. It's a multi-phase, multifactorial approach that will ultimately end it. And you're probably right. And you know, Nick would tell you that within two years, mm. he'll be able to nuke hair loss completely. And, and yeah, well, well, I, I believe we'll absolutely get there. I, I just want people yeah. to understand. I am not walking around telling people I have the cure for baldness. <laughs> not yet, Victor. Not yet, not yet. You know, like, but the, the, the conversations that I hear are just, they're, they're just, they're silly. They're silly conversations. They're, they're the, silly, the silly conversations like testosterone will give you prostate cancer. It's just silly, you know? So, so, would, so would you, to end the show, and by the way, um, you know, guys, as always, please support the amazing people that come on the Jay Campbell podcast. Uh, this is Victor's website. You can go to Victor oh, Mac cool. Masterclass. <laughs> 
of course, dot com and coach with him, reach out to him. I mean, I know you will get a lot of people that will come through the, come through this portal. Uh, my only question, though, specifically is obviously you work with people from all around the world. There's no limitation due to geography, correct? No, I mean, I, I mean, the fact that we're sitting in different countries now talking, I mean, there's there's absolutely no reason that I can't have this dialogue with anyone else. This is like sitting in a room and we live in this uh, incredible place with technology. Totally. You know, any people send me blood work people kind of ask for you know one-time consult consults people ask for regular ongoing you know relationship in terms of coaching and as i said i work from everyone from overweight executives that are looking to optimize their health for you know the performance advantages in the in the in the professional workplace to professional fighters to endurance athletes to bodybuilders to powerlifters when you understand the endocrine system and when you're able to understand the tools that we have available in 2021 to mod positively and negatively modulate the endocrine system, then I don't think you need to be in the same room. I mean, I, I don't count reps and change plates for people in the gym. <laughs> I'm, I'm, more, I'm more strategic than that. <laughs> Bro, do you meal prep? Okay, man. This was such an enlightening, engaging, amazing, you know, halfway across the world conversation. Uh, I want to do it again with you. And like I said, I'm going to bring you back and let you talk about your real specialty, which is like drugs and how to use them again to live longer and stronger. Because as you know, I've been saying very similar things that you have for a long time now. It's all about living a fully optimized life. It's all about, like you said, pushing the needle, but pushing the needle in a way that will not confer, you know, abnormal risk. And I, I think that, you know, guys like you are more people need to know about you. Um, I think, you know, the way I look at it is there's a lot of physicians out there that can hire you because you I, I, I actually have, you'd be surprised by how num how many doctors follow my content. Yeah, like, no, I already know that. Bro, they I, all I, I, I quite a lot. Cause I get, a, I get a lot of messages from guys going like, fucking keep up the work. Good buddy. You're like, Bro, so that's the only people that yeah. follow me too. Yeah. So, I, the, 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 the more, aware people are the more savvy they are the more they they're they attracted to the content because they recognize the value of the content they go you know what it's not necessarily that i mean the great example i'll give you the example of scott i'm a huge fan of scott i love his work right yeah. if if scott makes public content i'm putting time aside to listen to what dr scott house says right the challenge is i'm just very honest i'm, I'm very transparent it's a long time between drinks he's a very busy man Yep. He's an antigen researcher in his own right. You know, yep. I have probably six pieces of content that Scott has that he's made publicly, including the content he made with you, right? Yep. And I think it's fabulous. My only lament, and, and I'm very public about this, is I, I wish he put, put, it, put a piece of content out like that a week and he can't. Right, right, once, once. And, and, and this is really my value to the community. And that is, you know, I'm prolific in the content I create. It's coming out daily. It's coming out weekly. I'm not arrogant enough to think that i have the 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 understanding of this subject matter that guys like dr scott how have i'm doing my best but my value to the community is two things one is i bridge the practical real world application guys you know and scott has some practical experience agreed but it's really i'm trying to put out enough content that people can have a feed of stuff coming in like like yourself like it's 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 about you know, the content is is relentless relentless and a, a lot of these guys you know that's not their that's not their wheelhouse that's not right. what they do so um it's, i don't well, i'm fortunate because the clinical community is falling behind dude i mean guys like you and i are embracing technology and you know mm. using essentially the same science and the same practical strategies and understanding and awareness that they have but they're still limited by the archaic systems and structures their, their communication have. channels are not the best <laughs> Dude, it's unbelievable. All right, listen, my wife is texting me. I got to go get sushi. You got to go. Brother. It's awesome to, awesome to talk to you, Jay. Thank oh my you God. so Bro, much for I having me I want to make this a regular thing. Like you, you and I will pick two or three, you know, bullet points and I'll bring you on. I'm not joking. Like I'll bring you on once a month. I mean, that I would have be no great. problem. And we, we could create something amazing. So again, guys, for, for all of you guys that watch this channel, go to victorblackmasterclass.com work with him, consult with him one-on-one. -on -one. If you're a physician and you want to really learn what the hell is going on in the world about performance enhancement and living a longer and stronger life, this is the guy. So as I always say, Victor, thank you so much for coming on. And remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see you guys very soon.